Hey all you split subjects, welcome back to Plastic Pills. This will be your second dose of Lacan from me. In the first video, I discussed the mirror stage, uh, the imaginary and desire. Now due to some requests, and since I picked up a new skills since I made that video, here, check this out. <laughs> cool, right? Now, if you haven't checked out that video, pause this and go there first so that this one makes sense. Here, I'll throw it up right there. This video is gonna head down this way to the real, capital R. It's definitely the most elusive of the three and the most difficult to explain. Now, uh, some of my videos take a lighthearted approach or an ironic distance from the position I'm occupying on the topic, and this one won't. I don't think it'd really suit and I think you'll see why as it takes a lot of care to handle correctly. And to be honest, this was not an easy video to write because the real isn't something, it's a not something. So let's get back to this triangle here. Ooh. <laughs> These represent the three registers of psychical experience in Lacan's system. For the sake of this video, let's do this. So the imaginary and the symbolic form reality together, which is opposed to the real. Reality resists the real. In one sentence now, the real is what's beyond what you imagine existing, uh, the language by which you represent things, and your belief in the stability of everyday ordinary reality. And yet it does a lot more than that too. For Lacan, it's also the reason so much of what you do can't be explained, even to yourself or by yourself. It's why not even you know why you do what you do. That is, your neuroses. Okay, now check this out. Eh? <laughs> Call me a liar, but you ain't gonna see that on any other theory channel. All right, let's go in on this. We need this stable reality to function properly, represented by this plane. Reality is codified, built up by language, images, and other elements that form coherent significations, that is, meaning. This is where you find the construct of your ideal I, that is, the self that you imagine yourself to be. And it's also where you represent others, actual or imaginary. Ultimately, reality is a fiction meant to protect you from the yawning chasm of the real, a singularity that haunts your day-to-day -day subjectivity. The real is an abyss of meaning. It's beyond signification. It's also the absent cause of that endless loop of desire that defines subjectivity from the mirror stage onward. And yeah, it means that we'll never be happy or complete no matter how hard we try. The object of desire always eludes us. Watch that other video for that. Now the first rule of the real is that you can't talk about the real. Think of it like a psychic black hole, like a singularity. Here's the analogy. As you approach it like a black hole, the normal rules of reality break down and things behave differently. Identities are torn apart and everything else orbits this black hole, even though the singularity itself is not properly an object. It's the lack of an object that we only know by its effect on other things. That analogy turned out better than I thought. So desire and your attempts to get on in your life orbits this non-object. Still, it affects a lot of what you do, especially the things that you do that don't make logical sense. Your neuroses, phobias, obsessions, fetishes, and irrational anxieties about other people. Too real. All that weird shit you do is propelled by your unconscious as they act out these sort of defense mechanisms. And yet, we experience the real all the time, just always at a distance. It's like a silent background which haunts experience and we do our best to avoid it. Now we avoid this nothing because we can't function in meaninglessness, because there wouldn't be anything worth doing or not worth doing. This is not at all to be confused with being depressed or a nihilistic outlook, because even in those states, there are things that are more worth doing than others. The real is one step beyond any type of worldview, where there is nothing that can bear any significance at all, not yourself and not the world. If you have had an experience or something resembling it, this will start making sense to you 
a whole lot quicker. So here's the plan. Here's the plan. To get around this inexplicableness, I'm gonna to try to approach a definition twice over. The first via analogy, the second via the imaginary, and the third we'll talk to Lacan himself and what he says about the real. So before you go on and say, oh, you're such a hack, you wait, hold out, we're gonna get there in the third part, okay? Talking about the real real is impossible, as I've said before, and it's the hardest of the three registers and that's saying something because Lacan himself is one of the hardest theorists to read in the first place. So let's start segment one, an approach via an analogy. Lacan discussed the real differently throughout his career. It started as something like the noumenal, uh, which comes from Kant as a sort of object outside of the relations of experience and perception. But it gets most interesting uh, in Lacan's seminars where he develops it as this less than nothing something, nothing. The four fundamental concepts of psychoanalysis is where I'm headed, and it's the second most quoted of Lacan's work after écrit. So here's the real as found in the seminar book 11. Now you need an imaginary and a symbolic as screens that structure your psychic life in a manageable way. The imaginary and the symbolic shape how you imagine yourself, other people, and how you codify your position and activity in the world, and what's worth doing, what's not worth doing. You can encounter the real only somewhat and only indirectly when it ruptures or breaks reality. The real, says Lacan, must once again be apprehended in its experience of rupture between perception and consciousness. This noumenal thing. But almost all the time, the way you narrate yourself to yourself is wandering around it. So the best analogy for these ruptures of reality that we might experience are traumatic events. These are events which cause the meaning of the world to temporarily fall apart. The real is senseless. Think of these sorts of events that cause PTSD. Disasters, brutal violence, maybe abuse. And perhaps in a more positive or sublime dimension, psychedelic trips, where you sort of dissolve the boundaries between yourself and the rest of the world. What brings these events together is that trying to explain them to others, how, explaining how you feel, makes no sense, no matter how understanding that other person tries to be. Also, they cause the rest of the world to make no sense to you, and may return as symptoms in behaviors that you don't have control over later on. Think, for example, of an earthquake, like an actual earthquake that destroys your home and kills your whole family. Your entire life was built around having a home and a family. You have a job for the sake of your home and family. It's why you do what you do. It's what gave you guidance and purpose in your life. In fact, it is you in every sense of the way that you've structured reality. Then out of nowhere and without warning, it's suddenly reduced to nothing. That senselessness of your world collapsing there leaves you with the nonsense of being yourself. Now, in this analogy, which is probably not great, the real is not the event of the earthquake, it's what you're left with now that the earthquake has come and annihilated the structure of meaning in your life. This analogy does leave something to be desired because the collapse of reality is somewhat removed from you and it doesn't belong to you properly. So what does it look like when this distance is completely collapsed and removed? Consider as another example, rape, which is probably the most profound trauma that you could experience. Now the trauma of rape is more than the event and more than the violence of the event. The reality that is ruptured there is that you are an independent person with agency, rights, dignity, control over your body and your life. And the trauma of rape is that this reality of control and self-determination is utterly violated and destroyed. Now traumas as events are disastrous and I don't wanna downplay them. But what Lacan points to in trauma is that these are the sorts of events that collapse your whole life narrative, which is mostly, according to him, a very thoroughly constructed fiction, but you need that fiction. Now a second point about traumas that correlate to the real is that you carry them around with you for the rest of your life, and that's important. You don't know what can trigger the memory of a trauma to recur, but there's always a chance that it might. 
Over time, uh, most people, thankfully, can piece the world back together and the trauma can be reincorporated into a narrative, which brings it back into reality. Again, because it's signified. Mostly. Reality will always be a little less stable afterwards. Now to be clear, it's not that these traumatic or sublime experiences are themselves the real, because the real itself is empty. Rather, these events cause the comfortable reality you are living in to break down, so you're left with nothing but that chasm of the real. And when that's all you have left, you're probably left sobbing in the fetal position because there's nothing else you can really do. In Lacan's view, your whole psyche is constructed around not letting you experience the real. What it means to be a subject is that you've lost something of yourself, which is why you run around in life trying to fill it with relationships, career, fulfillment, or whatever else. But what you're trying to get back, paradoxically, is something that you never had. Remember that pre-mirror stage, you're already a fractured assemblage of drives and your unity is only fictional. So to experience the real is to experience every fiction that you've built up as fiction. And there every safety net is pulled away and that's why the world falls apart until you can build it up again. Now every subject knows the real and not consciously, but somewhere deep down because the real is the object of a latent fear that everything might fall apart. That is everything that you've been building up starting with the mirror stage. Here, this should start sounding a lot different from mainstream psychology. Mainstream psychology is about getting yourself back to your normal self, where you can function relatively well. Any number of hacks, psychologists, gurus, yogis, YouTubers, will offer you advice on how to become your true self, as if you could get back to it somehow. Happiness, the, def the definition, is being true to yourself, and they're telling you that you really are in there somewhere. And the best way to get down to it is to follow their 12 rule plan. Doesn't look like that worked out. According to Lacan, you don't want to find your true self because there might not be anything there at the bottom. A functional life is spent not being yourself in the least neurotic way possible. Now this might sound all kind of depressing, but it kind of makes sense with what we know more explicitly and consciously, right? We are basically accidentally conscious primates performing inconsequential tasks on an insignificant rock for an insignificant amount of time. But even if you're cynical about your importance from a cosmic perspective, virtually no one actually lives like that's the case, whether or not they say they believe it. So there's two forms of belief here. One is giving mental assent, saying I know that my life doesn't really matter all that much in the long run. But then there's a form of belief where you actually act out the things that you say you believe. Now one is definitely part of the symbolic and the imaginary, and the other part is deeper than that. Now even if very well put together people say they don't believe life has meaning or purpose, for example, this very popular YouTube channel, which is much more popular than mine, and it says this. Lacan is preparing us to face the darker possibility that in fact other people will be resolutely stuck on the outside of us, assuming us to be pretty much as we seem, but heavily caricaturing us without meaning to. We're understandably reluctant to accept this loneliness and are consequently very concerned to control the external appearances that we present. That's what the fashion industry trades on. We hope that if we could tinker sufficiently with what other people see externally of us, perhaps our hair or the design of our collar, we may eventually be properly understood. Oh my God, that is such a trash take. All we really want is to be understood. And that's what Lacan is saying. Lacan is just worried that we might feel misunderstood by other people. Ah! Lacan suggests a more difficult, mature move, that we accept that other people simply won't ever experience us the way we experience ourselves that we will be almost entirely misunderstood and will in turn almost entirely misunderstand. Oh my God, this is so obnoxiously wrong. It's so wrong that you couldn't even make a case that Lacan ever said that. Lacan is not a high school guidance counselor. You can't understand anyone else. Like what would understand even mean in this context? Knowing why they do what they do? You can't even understand yourself ever. 
And the actual problem here, the actual problem is a truth that we're way more afraid of, is that there isn't anything there to be understood, even if anyone cared enough to try. What our psyches help us with and what they prevent us from realizing, good guy psyches. What they prevent us from experiencing is that reality is a facade repressing the suspicion that you don't have a purpose and that you're not significant. That means you cannot be signified with anything meaningful. You can't live believing that, which is the function of the ideal I. The ideal I takes your place in reality almost all of the time. And there's always this gap between the ideal I and you. And that gap is the reason why you have neuroses, why some people are paranoiacs, narcissists, or psychotics. Stay away from them. These are all habits developed in dealing with the threat of the return of the real. Let's take a second pass at this via the imaginary. How do you compare you to your ideal I? And that deferral is where the abyss of the real opens. So you're not busy, right? Want to do some therapy? <laughs> Even if you call yourself a self-aware person and no matter how honest you are with yourself, you probably do your best to avoid owning up to your neuroses, particularly in social interactions. You must wear a mask around anyone that you care about. People you want to date, people you want to impress, your parents, your social media friends. Hey. Now, most of the time, it's ridiculous to not pretend that you are that persona. Believe me, it's better for you with its cool interests and productive habits and kick-ass YouTube videos. Now, even if you know that you're not acting like yourself, you still maintain a more private image of who you think you are. Your imaginary self is still something relatively complete, something significant, and something worthy of other people's love and desire. You know, you're generally a good person who tries to do the right thing, and when you don't, you have a pretty good reason for why you didn't. And if anyone else took the time to figure that out, they would get you. Now, even when you're alone with your imaginary self, it's not like a mask that you can just take off. That's way too simple. Because you believe in that too, that fictional person. You either believe that it is you or that it could be you if you took a little more time to work at it. So even when you're alone, what Lacan calls the big other is watching you even though it doesn't exist. It's making sure that you exist for you, and it makes sure that you give good reasons for why you're doing what you're doing. Even without anyone else around, you justify yourself to another part of yourself. This is the symbolic relation. Now that's the symbolic relation. When you're alone, you're not really alone. But the real is also in that relationship. The reason this symbolic process exists is to protect you from what you may sometimes suspect deep in your soul, Namely, that you disappear without the constant attention of other people, that you are rather depraved, or at least you continue to make the same mistakes over and over again and then justify it to yourself, or that you vacillate between being compulsive and lazy and yet pass judgment on everyone else for doing the same thing to make yourself feel better. And finally, that you project blame onto other people for why you are basically nothing like what you pretend to be, that you're maladjusted and afraid of being exposed. And not just because that exposure would be uncomfortable, but because that exposure would expose that there's nothing actually to you. <laughs> Shit, that real enough? Don't worry, we're not even at the ground floor yet. Now, none of this yet differentiates ordinary psychology from Lacan's psychoanalysis, except that psychology thinks that you feeling bad is the problem and wants to fix that through therapy or whatever else. The goal is to make you okay with yourself, to give you a positive self-image, to help you stop thinking negative thoughts. And that's what most therapy and some stupid YouTube channels attempt to do. The con goes much further, and let's see if I can do this. There is first the mask that you present outwardly, and you know that one's a lie. But then there's also a second mask that you present, and that's not for anyone else. That's where you present yourself to yourself. So look, even if you deal with constant self-doubt and self-criticism or fear of exposure, social anxiety, as crippling as these things may feel, you still maintain a belief in your own value, namely that you're worth doubting and criticizing. Because even if you're not worthy of someone's desire now, 
you might be if you had some time to improve. Now the real or exposure to the real makes even these feelings seem farcical. They significantly overrate your position. And if you habitually overrate it too much, you become a narcissist because narcissists blow up their own significance in an effort to block that hole of the real. That's their learned defense mechanism. Lacan writes along this vector that we see here a point that the subject can approach only by dividing himself into a certain number of agencies. One might say what is said of the divided kingdom. That is, a divided kingdom will fall. That any conception of the unity of the psyche, of the supposed totalizing, synthesizing psyche ascending towards consciousness, perishes there. So when you come to fully experience the cosmic joke, of every fabrication you've made about yourself, not only that you're not gonna change the world, and not only that no relationship you have will ever make you happy, and even when self-doubt and self-criticism become just absurd, that's when you're edging towards the event horizon of the real. And that's when reality really falls apart. Although long before you have to confront yourself for not being yourself, you encounter a bunch of screens or justifications that stop you before you get there. These are your defense mechanisms kicking in. Oh, come on, of course I'm not so bad, of course. The future will be better. So you're transposing the now into the future when you may become desirable then. The mirror stage gives you the first screen, then the signifier I, and then all of these other constructions of comparing yourself to the image of your ideal I and ultimately believing that that's actually you. So let's look at the sorts of things that cause PTSD. Abuse, brutal violence, senseless disasters. These cause your relatively stable, coherent belief that the world makes sense to fall apart at the seams. There, the world and all of your ordinary concerns and desires become senseless. And if you've had an experience like that, you know that in a process of recovery, it feels like there is no way to communicate the overwhelming <laughs> brutality of that trauma to somebody else. That unspeakableness is why the real is the real. <sighs> Finally, the real. So the real has traumatized you. The real is not a traumatic event. The event itself is just the trigger for that earthquake in your psyche that what you have secretly suspected and repressed all along is true. That is the rupture of the real. And I hope now you can see why it's worth it to set up this whole psychic apparatus so that we don't have to think that way. With a rupture, when something terrible happens, the apparatus stops working. And if you've had an experience like that, it's brutal and takes a long time to recover. Well, for Lacan, living itself is recovering. Now here is where Lacan goes far beyond psychology in any pedestrian sense. Everyone, every subject has that trauma of the real under their reality somewhere. The trauma begins in the mirror stage. The mirror stage is the first plane erected against it. And the reason you can never be happy, the reason you endlessly desire, and the reason that all subjects are neurotic is that we have that lack, that real black hole hiding somewhere under every fiction that you've constructed. You know this, but you don't remember that you know it. It's a lost object we never had. So I promised you some actual Lacan, uh, so let's turn to that. Here he goes. Let me simply say that this is what leads me to object to any reference to the totality of the individual since it is the subject who introduces division in the individual, that is the habit of saying I, as well as into the collectivity that is his equivalent. Psychoanalysis is properly that which reveals both one and the other to be no more than mirages. So, viewer, I don't know who you are or where you're at, but if the real has broken into your experience or something approximating it at some time or another, You'll know what I'm talking about. I don't want to give examples because it's incommunicable and that's not just a gimmick. This is why the real cannot be sublimated, signified, or even expressed in language because that experience could never make sense to someone else. 
but it'll shake your faith that you are actually yourself. For Lacan, it is not remarkable that at the origin of the analytic experience, the real should have presented itself in the form that, oh God, which is unassimilable in it, in the form of trauma. So Lacan here is talking about one of Freud's patients. After some time and probably some therapy, survivors of the rupture may be able to coherently describe, that is narrate their experience in a story as a meaningful event. But to make sense of it means that the reality of those situations has already, by that point, been reconstructed, or in Lacan's terms, the world has been placed back on its feet. So once you can offer a structured narrative that makes sense enough to other people, that's when the world can start making sense once again. There are radical points in the real that I call encounters, says Lacan and which enable us to conceive reality as unterlegt, untertragen, which with the superb ambiguity of the French language appear to be translated by the same word, souffrance. Now souffrance in French means um, like long suffering, waiting, and also suffering itself, so pain. So this double meaning gets both to the point that this uh, real is underlying your experience and the pain of rupture and collapse when it actually emerges in your experience. So just think again by analogy, think of what it's like to watch someone who's been traumatized, if you've experienced that. They can't be reasoned with because they as a subject are not there yet. They are not there able to present themselves to themselves, let alone to other people. And it takes a long time before a survivor's experience can be mediated, rationalized, and fit into a narrative that explains why. And yet the whole purpose of this narrative is trying to give some meaning or rationale to an experience. So this real or this analogy is for Lacan what you are doing at every moment of your life as long as you're not running on you know, full autopilot. You're still trying to give meaning to this whole. The real then is just this void to which you add all your justifications, reasons and meanings. But ultimately, it's only blocking up a lack, a hole in the whole layout of reality. And now you have a real because the real cannot be faced with any regularity. Actually, it's worse than that. It's like there's less than nothing there. It's a lack of nothing, a negation of nothing, because what you hoped would be there isn't. Yet the processing after the fact is what makes the real the real and why you avoid it, why you're afraid of it. In recovery, where you build up the apparatus back so you can function. And from the psychoanalytic view, there's this whole process of rebuilding the subject's reality, which is living or overcoding that encounter with the, in symbolic terms. Only after the fact can you speak of it. Now what's important for Lacan is not that you have to experience something traumatic to know about the real, because most of what we do as subjects is trying to avoid the recurrence of that original trauma that was forced on us, all of us, in becoming subjects from the very start. We lost something that we never had, significance. The lives we have to live are always overcoming the fact that some part of us knows deep down that life driven by the pleasure principle is senseless and absurd. The real is that truth becoming real in our conscious life. Temporarily. So when you go to an analyst, when your repetition of symptoms becomes like disruptive, you're not trying to cure the cause because the cause, the real, is incurable. It's there because you're a subject. That said, I don't really know how this video is going to land. I think it'll make sense to some and not to others. And I didn't want to furnish it with too many specific examples. The main reason is that such experiences are going to be incredibly personal. And though the same real is down there for every subject, if Lacan is right, that is. So thank you for making it to the end, and I hope you got something out of this in any case. And plastic pills, make connaissance.